did a, a workshop on um, on addressing sexual violence within within groups, and one of the things that I uh, that I really feel like I feel strongly about is that if you have a, a new group, um, one of the first orders of business should be to uh, to figure out a procedure, a set of procedures, a plan for how to address uh, forms of, of sexual violence that occur within groups, like how, like a step-by-step -step agreed upon process. Uh, because if you don't do it beforehand, um, you'll get caught off guard and um, it can, it can uh, have really just awful effects, um, especially for, for survivors. I think survivors have to, having to, to go through that without, um, without having, um, having something to rely upon, like something, some game plan to, re to rely upon um, can, can cause more trauma, can cause, you know, more trauma. Yeah. So maybe we could talk about that for a minute. So um, you know a lot more about this th than I do. What are some good, like best practices that, that activist organizations should use um, for dealing with sexual violence? I mean, the, again, it's like, I hate to be a, a broken record, but again, it's like, have a plan, like talk mm -hmm. about it talk about it. And I think also talking about it in worst case scenarios, right? Yeah. And I'm saying that it's like, what the fuck, like sexual, you know, can't get any worse. I mean, worst case scenarios in terms of, um, you know, for instance, if you're a hierarchical organization and uh, the, uh, the head of the organization um, is, uh, um, um, has preyed upon somebody, how are you going to handle it? Like, how are you going to address it and have it be specific, right? A specific right. set of agreed upon processes to, um, to address it. And I mean, this goes without, without saying, but I think with, uh, with sexual violence, what, what should be prioritized is, uh, you believe the, the survivor, you believe, um, the person who is, um, who is accusing. Um, and if you start from that best practice and follow from there, um, I think different organizations can form, um, different processes, depending on how they want to engage, if, if, and how they want to engage in restorative justice. Like, mm. um, I don't want to say, I don't want to give a, a prescription for like all organizations and you're giving me the, uh, uh too much credit. Like I have, oh. I have experienced these things, but I have, n I'm by no means like a, um, I'm, I'm not a professional. Right. Um, but I've, I've experienced it and I've talked to enough people to where there are basics that I, um, that I, that I believe in. And one of them yeah. is like best practice, start by believing the survivor, um, and, and take it, take it from there. Um, but I think, you know, talking about it and talking about it in terms of, okay, what do we do if this happens? What about this? What if this, um, and just tackle it heads on so that you're not caught off guard. Yeah, I love that. I mean, come, come up with a battle plan. That might be like, you know, the main yeah. takeaway. If anybody has a takeaway from this, have a battle plan for sexual violence, have a battle plan for your activism plan ahead. What, yeah. So one thing that um, Sarah Shulman talks about in Conflict is Not Abuse and that I think uh, you know, we've talked about before a little bit is the fact that there have been cases where people have infiltrated activist organizations and made... Um, made allegations of misconduct in order to, to hurt the organization. And what I w so imagine that you and I were forming an activist organization and we need to come up with our sexual violence um, policies. And we start from the idea that we want to believe, um, we want to believe accusers. How, how do we deal with uh, that potentiality as well? How do we build that into our process? I think, it, uh, again, um, you know, Number one, if you st I think if you start from this best practice of that is so it is so statistically rare right. that that happens that you have to um, you have to start start with that and yeah. start with the ethic of protecting um, protecting survivors protecting um, people who are accusing um, protecting them and also you know the the group agreeing that if, if you are the one who is, um, who is accused, if you are the offender, um, you need to agree that, you know, like for instance, a, that you're going to leave the organization for a period of time. Um, and that you are going to participate in these, in these steps to address what's going on. And, um, if that's, if that's your, your plan, then everyone has to agree to it. And then it's just like, if that ends up happening and, 
like if I were accused of something in a group and I have agreed that like, okay, if I am played the, um, played the card, the statistically extremely, extremely rare, rare, mm-hmm. that rarity, um, if that happens, well, like tough luck, like I, I see. okay, going to do this. Um, I just think it's, especially in the context now, and given that it is so rare for that to happen, um, that a group needs to acknowledge it, but then also start from this place of, um, it's so rare to think that that happens regularly enough to where you have to um, address it as if it's uh, as if it's a, a, a potential thing happening here now is like that's not that's 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 going to be uh, that's going to be more toxic um, than than helpful. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So it's sort of a. Um... I mean, one crude way of putting it is that it's like a cost-benefit analysis where the probability of a false accusation for political purposes is so rare that that's not what we need to be basing our policies on. We need to base them on the more likely scenario that somebody is telling the truth and we start by believing them. And if you are accused and you are, in this case, um, innocent, you should still go through the procedure and you, you leave the organization for a time and you, uh, you sort of, um, you know, go, go through whatever steps to conflict mediation um, that have been set up. Yeah. And if that, if that means that you have to leave the organization for good, then that, um, then that has to be. And I think like one thing I want to mention too, is that, you know, a positive thing that's happening right now is that we are acknowledging that behaviors that we've taken for granted in the past are actually forms of rape and okay. um, because we're starting to like to acknowledge that we live in a culture of rape that we live in a um context of, of patriarchy and these things that you know again like behaviors things that have um that have occurred in the past that seem like just normal are now are now becoming acknowledged as um forms of violence as as mm. forms of, of assault um, so I think uh, if you're a person that's that's being accused, I think keeping that in mind and keeping in mind that like, you know, if if something has happened and you feel like genuinely that it wasn't your fault, you have to keep in mind that we live in a society where there are a lot of ways that we behave that seem uh, that seem perfectly fine and they're and they're not. Um, I think this applies to anti-racism. Um, it applies to a lot of things. Like I've I've been like relatively recently like called out um, for like for abusing white privilege, and mm. it's like the um, initial reaction is oh, me. I do right. so much. Like, that's the white fragility, and it's like you got to keep that shit or keep that stuff in in check. Like you have to mm-hmm. keep it in check and say like okay. Um, like you, you, you start from a place of like, I am anti-racist. Like I need to address this, including in my, in myself. And I think the same uh, qualify, um, the same, um, applies, applies in, uh, in sexual violence as well. Yeah. So that's really, so it, it seems like there's a, you know, we talk about virtues, like these, these, these character, these sort of habits of thinking and, and behaving. And I think one virtue that you're promoting is, um, humility where, um, you know, even if it seems to me like I didn't do it, I ought to doubt my testimony. I ought to doubt my understanding of my own motivations and behaviors, given a culture in which I'm being conditioned to misunderstand what I'm doing. Totally, totally. I think that's really, I mean, the, the uh, self-reflexivity, right? It's like just constantly thinking about like, what am I, what am I doing today? Like, how do I say this? And what ways can I be better? Um, I think that's really... Um, that's uh, ex- really Im- Im- important when you're um, when you come from a, a position of, pr- of, of privilege. Yeah, well, that's fascinating. Um, yeah, and and so when we talk about, um, I, I want to do a little bit of conceptual analysis again because we got like with with violence. I think it was really useful to talk through this and talk about like how we want to use definitions and what values are we um, are we supporting if we use this definition of violence versus this definition. Of violence, and I think in in the case of um, sexual ethics, there's something very similar. I've never been to a, a workshop about um, sexual ethics in an in an animal rights activism space that went beyond consent. And the worry that I have about that is that um, when we frame things in terms of consent, what we're doing is we're talking about a very particular kind of speech act where somebody is making a request and then somebody else can agree to or 
not agree to follow the terms and conditions. And consent works great for used car sales, where it's like, I'll sell you my car, do you consent, do you not? And I can use basically whatever tactics I want to get you to buy my car. But it's consent, as I, I think it's a terrible model for typical sexual negotiations. And this is something that Rebecca Kuk, this is not my idea, this is Rebecca Kukla's idea. She has a paper called, That's What She Said, The Language of Sexual Negotiations, which everybody should read, it's a fantastic paper. It's tough. I mean, I think the, the thing yeah. is with, um, with consent is it is a f- really sad thing that that's where we have to start from. It's like, yeah. I think, I think in a lot of ways um, people are just starting there because even getting that, getting that to be acknowledged is hard. And it, that yeah. is a sad, sad thing that like yeah. just getting, I'm thinking, Oh gosh, I wish I could remember it. There's a, uh, there's a video on like, on a, uh, that compares like giving tea to yeah. somebody. Do you know what I'm I've seen that. Yeah. Um, oh, it's so good. Um, I'll throw a link in the description. Oh, perfect. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, the, I think the fact that we have to start there is a sad thing, but I think hopefully it is acknowledged that we're just starting there um, mm-hmm. because I think it's widely acknowledged that like, you know, one, one of the reasons why we have, you know, uh, internal policies against, uh, against, you know, uh, bosses, you know, sleeping with their subordinates is because that involves power. And like, when you have power, if someone consents, it doesn't, that doesn't, it's meaningless. If there's the threat of retribution, if you don't consent, like then consent means, means nothing. So it's like, that's very well acknowledged in a lot of ways, but um, putting that into practice, especially when we look at forms of like societal coercion, um, coercion can be, um, are in are are embedded in us, or we're socialized to um, you know to, uh, to 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 be coerced. Um, addressing that is a lot is a lot harder, um, and it's evolving, right? Like social justice is a moving target kind of a thing. Um, yeah, no, I think that's right. I I think the the worry that 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 Kukla has. I just want to put because that, that's what's one thing she considers, right? One thing that I've heard people say in response to her work is like, well we need to start here. If we can't even get this, like that, that's a, a huge problem. But I think the, the worry that you might have is that, that that approach might still set people up for, for failure. Cause then it's like, okay, I need to figure out the, the moves I can make to navigate this like legalistic conception of consent so that I can coerce somebody into having sexual yeah. relations. And that's what happened. If you think about like um, the, the Aziz on sorry thing um, where he, there was that, that babe.com article that came out about him where I, I don't think it would be correct to describe anything he did as, as rape or as a violation of consent. But I do think what he did was, was um, if the article is correct, disgusting and like um, sex, like immoral. And it was immoral on the grounds that you don't use used car salesperson tactics when you're negotiating sex. Like it should be something where you're trying to foster the agency of the other people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've seen other people do this. And, and so that's, some, that's something that I worry about. I worry that we're setting people up for failure by giving them um, tools that don't help mm-hmm. them foster the sexual agency of others, but instead come up with legalistic um, frameworks for creating boundaries of permissibility for sex that don't actually help. Mm-hmm. God, yeah, that's a, um, yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's like, a, that's a really important, that's a really important point. Maybe it is, I go back to like, you know, I'm, I think the, the sociology is like, is uh, embedded in me because I, I tend to think like you have to acknowledge the ways that we're all just functioning based on how we're, based on the, the structures around us. Right. We're all so structurally guided. Um, that, you know, to look at, at, you know, why people, why people want to, you know, why coercion exists. A lot of that is based on this, like, you know, culture of like patriarchy and toxic yeah. masculinity and like starting from that place and trying to, to dismantle that, you know, there's, uh, there's a lot of ways to, to address it, but I, I definitely see the point of like starting at a place can end up being self-sabotaging because it can be used against you as, uh, you know, if we don't start at that place though, where do we, you know, where do we start? This is kind of a problem with like incremental change, right? Where right. it depends on the path that you follow. Like, yeah, it isn't always positive. It depends on what types of change you're, you're trying to, to seek. 
Yeah. I, I totally agree. I get frustrated with people who have these like grand, you know, castle in the sky visions and they're like, hey, don't do this incremental stuff. It's not perfect. I want to talk about what we're going to do today. And you could still implement the model that I'm talking about incrementally. So what you could say is like, we're going to talk about sexual negotiations and invitations where if you are a CEO, you don't get to issue a sexual invitation to somebody who's working for you. If you're leading an activist organization, you don't get to issue a sexual invitation, no matter how innocuous, to somebody who you have supervisory control over. Like, that's not okay. And it, consent isn't the important topic here. It's like, that's a bad invitation. You don't get to do that. Um, and then we can have a positive view also. We could say like, look, when you're negotiating sex with people, don't just try to get this bare minimum of like, was it permissible? Strive for like fostering the agency of others. Strive for like trying to help them explore what they want to do and work on this communal project together. That, that, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing. Um, so I think like I'm totally on board. Like I, I love the idea of like an inc like a um, incremental changes we can implement tomorrow to try to fix the horrible world of um, sexual misconduct in in all organizations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in other movements too, you know, like the types of incremental change that we seek out as as um, as you know as animal advocates um, is important too, right? So I you know I. I personally think that that seeking out policy shifts that embed activists within the institution that we're targeting um, is something that can actually have have a have an impact. Hmm. I haven't seen that welfare policies can have much of an impact outside of costing a lot of money. And I think that's yeah. actually good. It can be a tactic too, right? Like our strategy, a good strategy. Um, but yeah, I think the, you know, the Assuming that incremental change is, is good, is, is um, it, you need to have a battle plan. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs>